I asked uh, Jonathan to sing that last song, and I hadn't even thought about the one he chose earlier concerning the heavenly city. I do want to fine-tune that last song a little bit because it makes it sound like a number of our songs do that when a person uh, dies who's saved, that immediately they enter into heaven. Well, that's not the teaching of the New Testament. And we're not talking about the place where the spirits of dead men go awaiting the end of the world and the judgment and the beginning of living in that heavenly city. Uh, when we sing about and study about like such as Luke 16 and when Jesus said to the thief, Fairly I send thee today, shalt thou be with me in paradise. There are two different places. Heaven for those reared, I should say raised, which I guess is a form of rearing, <laughs> Uh, into a life eternal in a glorified body, that takes place at the end of time. Well, what happens to the people who die betwixt now and then? Then it's going to be that they reside in the Hadean world, a place of departed spirits. And, of course, the rich man was there, but he wasn't in paradise or Abraham's bosom. There was a great gulf separating where Abraham was with Lazarus and where Jesus went in the time he was dead. But across that chasm is a terrible place of torment where the rich man went, such as the place of departed spirits. Paul looked beyond that place of departed spirits when he wrote about the resurrection. He even referred to being just simply in the spirit without a body as being naked. Thus, by implication, I know God always intended that humans have bodies. But death separates us from that. The spirit, the body apart from the spirit is dead, James says. That's the simplest, best explanation I can give of death. It does not mean annihilation. It does not mean going unconscious. It means that your spirit leaves this body when we talk about physical death. But it goes to a holding place, if you want to call it that. It goes to a place where yet time continues here, known as Hades, and thus you find it described pretty well in Luke chapter 16 with the rich man of Lazarus. But all of that is over and done with by the time we reach the heavenly city. All that's for now. But then when this world is no more, because the elements have melted with fervent heat, the works also and the works that are therein, Peter says, are burned up. Then the resurrection will have taken place and the resurrection of the saved dead will be raised to glory and the resurrection of the unsaved will be raised to a state of damnation. Now don't ask me much of what that state's like because the Bible doesn't say much about it other than it's eternal corruption where the worm dies not where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, where there's a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which John says is the second death, the second separation, from whence no man will return. That's the final eternal home of the wicked. But there's heaven. As we sing sometimes, heaven will surely be worth it all. And today I want to speak to you about what we've already sung about, and that is that marvelous, eternal, heavenly city. If you will note Revelation 21, and uh, you can begin at about verse 20 or 2 and go through chapter 22 and verse 5, you'll see what we're going to talk about. I may not refer to every one of those verses in quoting them, but that's, that's the long text from whence comes this study of the heavenly city. But leading up to that, We remember in the study of Hebrews where we come to that great chapter of the ancient worthies who never knew the New Testament, but yet they were faithful to God with what God had given them. We read about Abraham, and inspiration declares that Abraham looked for a city. Notice in verses 8 through 10, whose builder and maker is God. Well, here on this earth, we're in a, a state of pilgrimage. We're in a body that's going to go back to the dust from which God made it at the time of our death. And you'll see that Abraham knew that. 
he might not have known a lot of things, but when he talks about what they knew of spiritual matters back in the patriarchal age, it's obvious. He knew that his eternal home was not on this earth. He knew that he was a pilgrim and a stranger, and he was just passing through. And yet he selected by inspiration to be the father of the faithful, to show that faithful people, faithful members of the Lord's church, fully aware that they can't put down any strong anchors here, for it's all going to be uprooted. It's not meant to abide. And you see then that this eternal city is, is, is built and made by God. In Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, you see that God prepared that for him and we may say for all who love him and keep his commandments. The inspired writer also penned that therefore we, as members of the Lord's church, as Christians, may look for that same city. And notice in Hebrews 13, 14, it says, which is to come. So it's yet in our future. It's beyond time, space, and material things. They are going to have to be all taken away at the end of time by the mighty power of God. And the judgment takes place, and those represented as sheep are on the right hand of Christ have heard, Come, you blessed of my Father, and hear it the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So it's a city that's promised by Jesus to those who overcome. In fact, early on in the book of Revelation, chapter 3 and verse 12, he makes that very clear. Over and over again, people have said, what is the mighty message of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation? Well, it's simply that we win. It's that simple. That may sound trite, but it doesn't take away the importance of it. Those who remain faithful are the ones who win. Paul understood that. He said, for the time of my departure, I like the way that he referred to death. For the time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And then he speaks of us and anybody else who loves the Lord and keeps his commandments that are faithful to Christ and the church. Not to me only, but to all those that love his appearing. So as we find uh, the end of the Bible coming up in that last great book, it's obvious and it's only proper that it says we win. Be thou faithful unto death and you'll receive a crown of life. Revelation 2.10. And thus, we're urging all the time that members of the church don't give up, don't stop, don't become weak, but remain faithful. You're not looking at things by human eye without any aid whatsoever from the truth of God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, For we walk by faith and not by sight. How do you do that? You examine things in the light of the revelation of God's Word, the source of our faith, Romans 10, 17. You look at all that's going on around you and what has gone on and, and you realize this is the way of this world. Uh, Satan's been given great power in this world. And we know as a lion, he goeth about a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You know, that day's coming to an end. And even today, if we love the Lord and keep his commandments and we're faithful, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, he can't touch us. It might cause the death of our body, but he can't touch our soul. So we see here at the end of the Bible, he begins to talk about the eternal abode of the blessed. He talks about this heavenly city. And John sees it in a great vision. And then in the words of inspiration, he begins to tell us about it and even warns us in Revelation 21, 2 through 8. But now it's interesting that God chose with infinite wisdom to reveal this great city in figures and images and symbols. And yet we see in this way or we get in this way the glimpse of that eternal city is far beyond anything we can comprehend. So for a little while, let's look at that. As I said, I'm not going to read every verse, but take note specifically for what I'm about to say. You might mark it. Of verses 9 through 21 of uh, chapter 21. 9 through 21. I should say chapter 22. Um, you'll see there that the holy city is revealed to John. Now, you know, I, I, I know anything revealed in the Bible. God wanted us to see it. God wanted us to understand it. God wanted it to benefit us. Well, I find it great encouragement to think of living in this city. God intended me to think that way. It's part of being saved by hope, Romans 8, verse 24. Hope is an amazing thing. It lifts a person up from where he is in time and space in the physical body 
following the teaching of the New Testament and allows him to look beyond everything there is between us and eternity. And through the eye of faith, we can see our eternal home. Uh, notice when you look at this that it was delivered by one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of wrath, and I'm not going to try to get into this as studied revelation at this time. I'm focusing strictly upon that which pertains to the heavenly city that John saw in a vision. And uh, that's in verses 21, uh, 9 through 10a. But also he offered uh, to show John therein the bride, the lamb's wife. I think I said 22 when I corrected myself for saying 21, but it is 21. So the angel carried him away in the spirit. I don't know what that means. Other than he's not in his flesh and blood body, he's seeing things God permits him to see, and he's carried into what is called a great high mountain. And there, John is allowed to see the great city, the holy Jerusalem. Look at verse, latter part of verse 10 through 11 of Revelation 21. Now it's pictured as descending out of heaven from God, uh, verse 2 in chapter 3, verse 12. And having the glory of God, I don't know what that means. Can you tell me what it means? It's like saying hallelujah, which is an ascription of praise to God. Well, I know it almost seems like when you can find no words to express your uh, feeling toward God, your thoughts about God, what you know the Bible teaches about God in His high and holy place, you cry out hallelujah. And uh, you say those things because they are ascriptions of praise. And so it is that you see these particular things listed here. The glory of God. And he begins to describe things by stones. We'll see more about that later. The jasper stone. He talks about uh, clear as crystal in Revelation 4, 2 through 3. Uh, he uses several stones. But this is all basically introduction. And I'm not sure of the imagery exactly, except I, I want us to remember that any time we read figurative language in a book like the book of Revelation, that it's designed to, to draw word pictures. You're not trying to just look into any one single solitary word and see everything that you're supposed to see or God wants you to see. It's, have you ever seen a mural where it's maybe depicting all the way back from the days of the colonies of people going west and they have all these different depictions maybe I know I've seen it one time in one post office where somebody had painted a mural and it depicted everything from the beginning of our history up through about the 1900s well you didn't look at any one thing and say there's the message the whole message was in the whole thing and this is the way you have to see the painting that's done by figures and symbols in the book of Revelation you don't focus in just on one thing. You may never quite get that right, but I guarantee you the people of the first century got it right because they were extremely familiar with this type of language and when it was used. And yet we know there's nothing taught in this book in figurative symbolic language or in images. It's not taught in plain language regarding salvation in the rest of the book. So the rule is we understand or try to the figurative language and a lot of the plain language. And that's what we are trying to do here. But we want to see this great heavenly city. And John begins to describe it in Revelation 21, 12 through 14. I learned from verses 12 through 14 that it has a very high wall. Now, just the concept of a wall means something needs to be protected. And that's the idea of walled cities of that time. And you have to think how people thought at that time about their cities. And for hundreds of years to come, cities would be protected by walls. So that was just something they thoroughly understood. And you'll notice it had 12 gates and uh, it has three gates on the east and three on the north and three on the south and three on the west. And we'll talk about that more in just a second, but with, these, with those gates are 12 angels. And with the 12 tribes of Israel's names are, or the 12 tribes of Israel's names are inscribed on those gates. And there's 12 foundations, and the name of the 12 apostles are inscribed on the foundations. In effect, that's basically saying everything in this is based upon the Word of God. It's based upon the truth of God. From where did that truth come? Well, it came from heaven. Jesus said that the truth will make you free. And so we can see that this city, this heavenly Jerusalem, 
where the saved after the great resurrection and the glory we go is meant to contain glorified humanity. That's where Jesus is now, sitting at the right hand of God, is glorified humanity because he's still the God-man. He didn't give that up, but he's still the God-man. So John says we don't know what we'll be like. Well, since he didn't give it up, he can say this, but we will be like him. Well, you don't become God, but you can become like him. And we begin the process of humbling ourselves and believing the truth and obeying the gospel here. And then we continue the process as we live according to the truth of the New Testament concerning Christian living. All the time understanding that the flawlessness and completeness will not be until the resurrection takes place. So there was no more need of the sun as we know it or the moon. Uh, those things are long gone. Yet those symbols have been used throughout the Bible I should say those things used as symbols. But it's the glory of God and the Lamb, Revelation 21, 23. It's radiant and will light the whole place. So we see that, uh, as we studied here a couple of weeks ago on Sunday morning, that this old world's passed away, as Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. And thus, what's left? Well, nothing's left but what God wants to be left. And we're talking about the place where we all long to go. Prophet said it's our long home. Meaning simply there's no leaving this place and who would want to? After all, the faithful Christians striving to be faithful in order to enter into that place. Now the devil has great power here on earth. The whole world, life and wickedness, John said. Or as the American Standard says, under the power of the wicked one. This is where he... He does what he does. Now, God in his infinite wisdom pretty much uh, just simply lets him be the test provider. He can tempt us only through the lust of the flesh, lest the eyes of pride of life. Tempt us to what? To break God's law. But we're told if we abide in the word, then we'll have the wherewithal to reject him. Lead us not into temptation is part of the model prayer. Well, if we're going to be able to escape temptation, then we're escaping sin. So we're taught to pray, lead us not into temptation. Where we're solicited by the devil, devil through one of those avenues to get us to break God's law to fulfill our desires. So the sun and the moon and those things have long burned up. And what's replaced them for the child of God? A new heavens and a new earth, 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. Let's notice something about this glorious city that's lighted or illuminated by God and the Savior. It's enhanced by even its citizens. I don't know that I've given that much thought to that, but that's the truth. It's a prepared place for prepared people. And not only is God and the Savior, the Father and the Savior, the lights of it, but in, uh, you'll notice that we're to walk in the light that we are to be children of light. And the nations of the saved shall walk in its light, John says in Revelation 21, 24a. And it's interesting to, to, to realize that nations, what, what does he mean by the nations? Well, the gospel is to be preached to the whole world. People come Christians, whether they're Chinese or Russians or us or anybody else, but in the same way, there's no difference. It's the same gospel, the power of God to save us, Romans 1, 16. It's the same New Testament that teaches us how to live wherever we are in the world or whatever nationality or ethnicity we are. The kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it, Revelation 21, 24b. Now, somebody might say, oh, you mean, are you talking about Putin? Are you talking about, like, no. I do know that when it could, well, this could very well be what it is, that may be referring to the righteous kings of the Israelites, such as David, such as Hezekiah, such as Josiah. And that doesn't cover those who are not Jews who lived under patriarchy back before the Jews ever were created to be what God intended them and were placed under the law of Moses for 1,500 years. Because all people at that time on earth approached God. There was no select ethnic group or nationality. So I don't know all those kings. We don't have all those records. But we have a little bit of a picture of things in the Old Testament of those who were not even connected to Abraham directly as far as the flesh is concerned. 
And we know that we're to be praying for those who are of high position in civil authority. Well, God would have all men be saved. I think that covers them. So we don't know who may or may not have obeyed God in years past and the people of the earth who obey the truth, whether small or great, and remain faithful will enter that city and be a part of its glory. We do know, certainly, that the Lord's church, those who remain faithful, the redeemed by the Lamb, will enter in together with Him, according to Revelation 22 and verse number 6. Well, you think about that, and if you don't watch out, you'll be thinking about your reading about somebody else. You'll think you're reading about people that have nothing to do with you. No, we're reading our future. We're reading our future. This is not something going to happen to somebody else and we'll have the television on watching it. This is what's going to happen to everybody that's faith of the Lord and the Lord's church. Now, that may be few in comparison to all those that ever lived on this earth, but I know when he says the redeemed, he means those redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And I don't know of anybody that fits that description today of accountable men, that is, people accountable to God for their actions, if that's not the Lord's church. Because the Lord purchased the church with his blood. He shed his blood for the remission of man's sins. And when men believe, repent of their sins, confess their faith in him, they're baptized into him. In fact, they're baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3 and 4. That's significant because it was in his death where he shed his blood and they're raised to walk in newness of life. They don't at the point of repentance have newness of life. They don't at the point of belief have newness of life, nor of confession of faith in Christ that they have newness of life. It only says you have newness of life, sins remitted, a child of God, a new creature in Christ when you rise up from the watery grave of baptism. And those then are ready to begin to live like the teaching of the New Testament says we should. And for those who do that, they're faithful unto death, then heaven's going to be their home. They're going to be, we're going to be in this heavenly city of which we've already sung twice in our worship period in song. Now notice that the gates of this city will not be shut at all by day. And he tells us why. For there is no night there. We sing a song like, like, like that or having to do with that. Those words are in it, Revelation 21, 25. There's an eternal day. There is no night to shut the gates to. Those old ancient cities, people farmed outside. They lived inside and for protection. They built walls, as we've already talked about, and they shut gates at night. But notice these 12 gates are of pearl, and they are the ones that remain open. There's no night. Why? What did we say? What did John tell us? Well, for the glory of God and the Lamb are ever present. He never leaves us. He's there. Folks, it's saying this is the way you'll walk in His very presence. That within itself should bowl us all over when it comes to what God's authored, that He can make it to where we could be in such a state that we can walk in the very presence of the Father and the Son. Nothing that defiles shall enter into it, Revelation 21, 27. Now, when I read of the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, lying, covetousness, fornication, homosexuality, all those things that plague us at this very second, all those things that have been in the world and will continue to be in the world and all of the evil that comes through thievery through cheating, through stealing, all that's gone. It's not there. Now, try to imagine today living in a place where none of those things. Well, I'm sorry to tell John, but he loses his job in heaven because there's nobody there for him to get after. <laughs> there's none of that. And I don't think he'll be wanting to get after anybody when he gets there. <laughs> We'll just be enjoying pure fellowship with God, having overcome the evil one in this world through faith and obedience to the gospel and a life of living righteous before God. So only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life entered it. Revelation 3, 5 and chapter 20, verse 15. We sing a song sometimes. It causes us to ponder and I hope think deeply when it says, is your name written there? 
You know, that's the question that should be foremost on our minds every day. Is my name written in the Lamb's book of life? Because only those are going to be enhancing that glorified city. Of all the nations, the redeemed will be there. Revelation 22 and verse 1 talks about the water of life, a pure river, clear as crystal. It proceeds from the throne of God and the Lamb. You'll remember Jesus used this typology when he talked about in Matthew 5, 6, that those who hungered and thirsts after righteousness are the ones that will be filled. And he doesn't, in other words, once something's used like that, then we can build upon the use of it throughout the scriptures to understand symbolic figurative language. And this is promised to all those who thirst, Revelation 21, 6 and 22, 17. Back there long ago in earthly ministry of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, he taught the same thing. So there's that water of life and that pure river. And there beside it is what's called the tree of life, Revelation 22, verse 2. So in the middle of the street, you can see this grand spectacle. Once you understand what life was like before sin entered this world in the Garden of Eden, the paradise of God, and that man was cut off from that by being cut off from the tree of life when he sinned. He had to leave that garden for it was prepared for sinless people and no longer were they that. Then we see if we find it again, it'll be because we follow the way of Christ and the gospel directing us how to get there because it's in heaven now. So it bears, according to the scriptures, 12 fruits yielding every uh, month, yielding fruit every month. I know one thing that means is perpetual provisions. Nothing is left out. Whatever needs there are, they're taken care of. And with leaves, it says, for the healing of the nations. No more sickness. No more hurt. No more anything like that. It just won't be there. As we sing sometimes, no more death and no decay. All that's past us. I promise you as we strive to comprehend this glorious side of heaven, you try to just think about where we are now with any, without any of those things that we live with every day. Can you conceive of living right now there's no sickness and no possibility of sickness? There's none of those things. And yet that's the way it will be in heaven. And you see that his servants are pictured in that city as reigning with him. Chapter 22, verses 3 through 5. When man sinned back in the beginning of things on this earth, Genesis 3, 17 through 19 tells us that God cursed the ground. As a consequence, the man sinned. And in the sweat of his brow, he had to work amidst, amongst all that stuff and weeds. And every time you weed your garden, you know that's what's happening. Well, all of that's taken away. All of that's gone. He's trying to say it's not like anything here on this earth you can think of no matter how grand it is no matter how beautiful it is no matter how much you've enjoyed it when you see heaven all that pales into insignificance so we're pictured the saved as reigning as his servants revelation 22 3 through 5 the throne of god and of the lamb is present the idea is there's continuation of all these great and good things and there's no end to it. Just to know that we'll be able to behold in the very presence of God our Lord and the Father himself is more than you can take in. And yet God's authored a system of salvation that if you live by it, that'll be possible. And yet notice when you go through the Old Testament how often we've seen that no man can see me because they haven't attained, we haven't attained at this time to that great glorified state of affairs. They're pictured in Revelation 3.12 as having 
uh, his name in their foreheads. What, what does that mean? We don't talk like that today. We're forever his. Closest we can come to anything like that is people branding their cattle so they can distinguish that cow from his. Or we have our driver's license and social security numbers is the way we go about saying who I am is different from everybody else, <laughs> fingerprints and so on. But this is the way God says that you belong to him. And you belong to him because you wanted to. And because you were willing to give up everything there is about this life that hindered you from knowing his word and doing what God said. And again, the emphasis on no night and no need of lamp or light of the sun. Again, reminding us God is the light. And they shall reign forever and ever. Because that's the way it is with those who love God when they could have gone the other way. And they died in faithful service to God. I want to focus just a minute before concluding about this marvelous city to which I hope we're going. And if we have before this day's over, that we'll make the necessary arrangements so that we can start. But we fail to understand that the place of hell is for all those people who prepared themselves for it. Now, how do you prepare yourself to go to hell? You do as you please. You have it your way. What people don't understand is God has said, as we read of in Romans 1, they desired not to retain God in their knowledge. And if they live their life that way, God says, this is a place for you where I will have no part of any of it whatsoever. You see, today, a wicked person fighting against God still has all these blessings of this life. The rain falls on the just and on the unjust also. But that's all going to be taken away. This life is a proving ground. Will you serve God faithfully according to the teaching of the Bible? Or will you do as you please? False religions, false philosophies, denying the existence of God, doing as you please, and hardening your heart when you reject what you know the Bible said you ought to do right. God says there's a place for the devil and his angels, and you'll be there with them. And there is no connection with God there. If you didn't want to know him here, God says, all right, you get your wish. You chose not to know me. You ran from me. You resisted the gospel. You wouldn't even admit what general revelation says, that there is a designer behind the design of the world. You didn't want it. You fought against it. You had all this time to use your mind to find the truth and love it and obey it. But you didn't want it. Okay. Depart from me. I never knew you. Under everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You made the choice. So heaven and this heavenly city is not the only place prepared for a prepared people. For those who don't want God, for those who are loved with themselves above all that there is, and they're going to have it their way no matter what, there's a place prepared for those too. But today we focus on that place because we're still in a position to make necessary changes to make heaven our home. This doesn't have to just be seen and it remains that way in its figurative form. This was given to us to say, if you think this is such a wonderful thing, then imagine what the real life will be. I want to go back over here, if I can get back to it, to notice the stones that are in that city. If you go back to Revelation 21, 18 through 21, You'll see the wall was jasper. We've seen that. The city was pure gold. It was like clear glass. And then, and most of the time, we won't take the time to do this, the 12 foundations of the wall were adorned with precious stones. Now, I'm going to read those and see if you can think about what they are. Jasper, sapphire, chalcedony, emerald, sardonyx, sardius, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, chrysoprase, Hyacinth and amethyst. Now, most of us won't be able, by our recollection of various ones, to know what they are. Well, now, you know God can just reach out here and look at any rock <laughs> or any kind of crystal or something, a precious stone, and put it in there. There's a reason they're there. Now, do I know all the reasons they're there? Well, I know that means the thing, at least in color, there are various shades of green and red and blue and gold and clear crystal. It's just, it's just dazzling. But I was looking here a week or so ago at some of these things, and I'm not sure it's of all of them, but it is of most of them. 
Because these stones have a history. Now, it doesn't mean what people thought of them all along, that they actually worked that way, but they had that reputation among all peoples. And usually it had to do that they had restorative powers. They had the power to heal or something like that. And I may be wrong, but I think that that's one reason that they're pictured here, not just because of the precious stones they are as we see precious stones, but because among the ancient people they had that kind of reputation so that when the person of 2,000 years ago who read this, they would have certainly recognized those particular things. And assuredly, if you can think of heaven itself, then you can realize it has the ultimate, of which there's no greater restorative powers. Can you think of a city any better than this? Well, I'd like to see you represent it in the way John did, and the Holy Spirit guided him the doing of it. So I'm looking for a city. I hope you are. I hope we realize the way to look for it is to be faithful to Christ. Whatever he asks of me, the only way I can show that I have confidence in him, faith, or belief in him enough to save me is to take him at his word. And Jesus would even ask, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. The only way that faith demonstrates its full confidence in Jesus Christ as Savior is to take him at his word and comply with of whatever he demands of us. Thus, he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So if you need to obey the gospel, I hope you will, because you can experience this city in reality when this old world's long gone. And when you step over into eternity at the day of judgment, you'll be able to know standing before the Lord that you'll hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. But if you don't do that, there's no hope for you. And you have this time in the flesh and this life to choose who you will serve. But you can reject him, and he has a place for those who choose that, who don't want to retain God in their knowledge and do things their way. But I'm appealing to you on the basis of what God's done for us, the great good he's done that's beyond our mind to know how good it is. But it's the ultimate good. And I'm going to a city and I think I'd like to say to everybody, and I think every Christian ought to be able to say it to everybody else, why don't you come and go with us? A humble obedience of the truth, being baptized in Christ for the remission of sins as a penitent believer, having confessed your faith in Christ. If you need to obey the gospel, we urge you to do so now while we stand and sing.